Hello, I hope you guys have had a wonderful week and nobody's having any issues with this most previous, most recent module. Today, we're going, the module that we're talking about today, we're going to step a little bit forward, forward and deal with art of today, pretty much. There's a couple of these artists that were producing stuff several years ago, but uh, they address a spectrum of what can be seen going on today in the, in, uh, the contemporary art world. There were a couple people that asked questions over the weekend, and um, there was a couple issues with um, technical glitches. I really can't do an awful lot about that. I did double check everything that I had uploaded, and from my end, everything looked good. If you guys have technical issues and there's problems, one person asked me for reference photos, and I emailed them, and uh, they um, those seem to be just fine now. If you have issues connecting with Canvas or anything with Canvas, I'd recommend getting a hold of their um, texts because they are really good at walking you through and helping sort things out. So today we're going to be talking a little bit, or this module, we're going to be talking about two primary things. One, artists doing contemporary work and the last stage of your research search project that you've been working on all semester, which is your narrated PowerPoint. Now, um, contemporary art, we talked about the difference between periods and movements. And I think contemporary art, we can say, is most more of a period than a movement, because contemporary art is bound by the present, essentially. It's not defined by a specific uh, cognitive process or a specific idea that artists are addressing or a specific style. Contemporary just means what's going on right now. And so contemporary art, we're going to be talking about art that has been produced since modern methods of transmission have been invented. So we're talking about electronic media. We're talking about uh, mass print media. We're talking about video media. And then we're also talking about uh, things like perform contemporary performance and conceptual art. And we'll touch on that a little bit. Lots of different kinds of things. If you're anything like my grandpa, um, a lot of this stuff does not appear to be art, just feels like scribbles or people throwing stuff at walls. And that's totally fine. I, whether or not you like it, in this class, the important thing is that you're able to look at it, identify it, and be able to talk about it intelligently using those four tools of artistic critique that we've been talking about. Again, critique does not mean being mean. Critique means thinking on purpose and looking at something with a methodology. And the four steps, uh, the four tools of artistic critique that we talk about are first description, second analyze, third evaluate or interpret, excuse me, and the fourth is evaluate, decide whether or not it's, it's successful. Whether or not you like it, whether or not it's even art, you can apply those four steps to anything and be able to uh, use your expensive words and talk about it in a way that people will just be astounded at how smart you sound. When we look at art of more than 200, 300 years ago, remember we were talking about, it seemed like all the art was, they tried really hard to make it realistic. They tried really hard to make it look cohesive. Sometimes it felt like there was movement. Most of the time, it looked like people may, may have posed for uh, the painting, which they, which they did. Uh, but what we're looking at is, is um, stuff that we can uh, tell ourselves, if you looked out a window or if you were there for the event, it's probably pretty close to what you saw. Starting with the Impressionists, we look how people, how artists started breaking away from those ideas. The Impressionists uh, broke up their patterns of laying paint down and did a lot of dots or short strokes. They played with ideas of color. They uh, expressed a lot of what they wanted people to see and we're trying to show what they saw as opposed to documenting historical or biblical events. 
We also look at uh, Dada, Cubism, and Surrealism. Dada, they were breaking away from uh, the expectations of static meaning in art, and we're more exploring just the process of making. Uh, in Cubism, they're dealing with overlaying many different perspectives um, and uh, many, and, and a lot of the times, in even different spots of time onto the same canvas. And the Surrealist dealt a lot with putting things together that felt like they meant something, that felt like they uh, accessed the subconscious mind, felt like they were symbolic, but they were addressing the whole idea uh, of subconscious meaning. And uh, then we also look at abstraction, where people are getting away from the idea uh, that something has to reflect the physical and natural world. Um, we look at the impressionists, they started abstracting things. You look at the, I'm sorry, the, one of the dogs is trying to get in my lap. Uh, we look at the impressionists and they were breaking away from the idea of making things look uh, realistic by adding in different colors, by changing the lengths of strokes, things like that. And um, in abstraction, it's even more than pushed even farther than that, where sometimes what is on the canvas bears very little, if any, relationship to what something that's real or physical or experienced. That's where people start painting emotions. You know, emotion isn't something that you can usually hold on to or look at directly. We can identify emotions because we feel we have uh, something of a shared symbolism in communication. Like when somebody's crying, uh, the chances are they're going to be either sad or extraordinarily happy. But that's more of a factor of expectation. And with the abstract people, instead of painting somebody crying, they would try to paint the shapes and colors that they felt were associated with being sad or extraordinarily happy. So again, you know, even pushing it further away from uh, what you could see out a window, like my grandpa would say. And with contemporary art, those, those movements that we talked about kind of broke the expectations wide open for what art could be. And in contemporary art, we're all over the world, um, all over the place. This is when we start identifying things as art because a person is able to express and defend their presentation as art, as opposed to meeting somebody's uh, previous expectations on what art is. The six artists that, we, that we're gonna talk about briefly in, in uh, this module is Cecily Brown. She's a painter who did, you look at her paintings without any context and it looks almost like really energetic spats of color on the, the painting, uh, on the canvas. Something like uh, Wassily Kandinsky uh, might do, uh, one of his improvisation series, something like that, where you just have areas of color. But what, she, what was interesting about her is she did use human form as a, a stepping off point. But in her case, she used the human form to find organic bits, um, color relationships, and things like that. And then she would apply those to a canvas. So she used the human form as an inspiration for, for little elements that made up her larger works. Uh, another one is a gentleman named Jean-Michel Basquiat, who's a New York painter. He was just really a genius. He was absolutely amazing. He understood everything you could possibly know about color theory and um, formal construction methods uh, and applied that to more of a contemporary real world vocabulary that involved things like graffiti and street art and text, stuff that people would interact with every day. And so he was also an abstract painter. And sometimes you can see very specific human forms, but a lot of, a lot of the times the human forms were more informed by um, chemically induced delusions or hallucinations. Sometimes they were strongly distorted by 
emotional experience rather than um, any sort of attempt at making it look realistic. And then the text sometimes would be applied as um, random textural elements. Instead, so if the words weren't important, the fact that the words were shaped the way they were were more important. And sometimes he would paint on it using the same kind of graffiti styles that he and his best friend would do when they would tear around New York and um, spray paint balls uh, as uh, just punk kids, basically. And so his paintings were uh, dealt a lot with that. But when you look at them, they have a lot of energy that feels like if New York had daydreams or some sort of mentality, um, these paintings could could feel like that. You know, it would feel, if a, a big city could think, this these paintings might be expressing what the big city was thinking. Another uh, artist on this in this module is a guy named Andy Warhol. I don't know if you saw Men in Black. I think it's number three. We find out that Andy Warhol was one of the uh, managers of the Men in Black uh, or an administrator of the Men in Black system governing uh, aliens and UFOs. And what was what's funny about that is um, the way they put it into the story, then my grandpa's perspective starts making a little sense because some of the wildest uh, art that we see was potentially inspired by aliens interacting with Earth, <laughs> which I think is pretty funny. But Andy Warhol was, um, there's some evidence to suggest that he was a Rosicrucian which is a rather interesting um, path of faith where a person becomes very knowledgeable about symbols of art and hopes to get people to think about where they fit in society by addressing them with specific things to respond to. Andy Warhol was also very aware of medieval art the icon, the European iconographic tradition, where people would have icons of the saints and Christ in their homes to remind them of different things uh, having to do with religion. He was also very aware of um, the importance of the reliquary in medieval life. And what was fascinating about him is that he tried to apply that to uh, things that were important for contemporary society society that was contemporary to him, uh, where saints would be important. Everybody knew who the saints were. Everybody knew who the saints defended uh, in medieval Europe. And for him, he felt that a lot of those relationships with these mythic heroes of saints had been transformed in, in American and, and contemporary culture into uh, the, the celebrity. And so that's where his uh, famous uh, images of Marilyn Monroe come from. Because uh, when you look at her image, even though it is uh, a photograph of her that was taken by um, a contemporary photographer, that was what Andy Warhol uses as reference for his painting. The way that it's set out and the way that it's displayed bears an awful lot of uh, cognitive similarity with um, the way that medieval icons uh, were uh, formatted. And his, instead of using the high medieval style of uh, tempera, egg tempera or oil paint, uh, Andy Warhol would use styles of uh, media that were more consistent with advertising media of his day, which is the um, mass produced uh, media. And that was silkscreen. That's how advertising posters were uh, generated with a silk, either directly with silkscreen or using the silkscreen to inform uh, the color separation for later printing. And so we get uh, his Brillo painting where the, the Brillo box, which is something that every right thinking family in North America needed to have uh, to help keep their kitchen clean. It is laid out on the canvas in the same kind of formal way that an icon of a saint was presented. And it is done, that's why he did silk screens. Campbell's soup, same kind of way. He is using these things that were ubiquitous in American culture at the time and presenting them 
in a different way than what people were expecting. And that was just one part of what made him absolutely amazing. Now there's a, we get into stuff that's a little bit more weird with a woman named uh, Marina Abramovich. She was um, kind of a performance and conceptual artist. Now with, we could, concept has to do with ideas. And we could say that all art on some level is conceptual because every piece of art deals with the ideas of the artist or the society within which the artist lives. And um, conceptual art is where that physical medium is kind of removed or is used as a creation tool. And the actual artwork is the idea, is the expression of the idea. Rather than building something separate to symbolize the idea, the artist tries to make the idea directly. And they try to do that by doing something that forces the idea into your brain. And so um, one of uh, Abramovich's famous performance pieces is that she would stand in front of somebody else, they would stand totally still, and for anywhere from 45 minutes to three hours, they would just reach their hands up and touch um, just with a, a single tip of one forefinger, the other person's tip of their forefinger. And then they would relax, put their arms down, and do that again. And they would stand that very, very still. We think about that and say, oh, that's not art. But when we start thinking about, she was working in a time period where it was with mass media growing and advertising growing and people seeming to lose their humanity uh, in the workplace. She's dealing with very directly concepts of human connection and human interaction. She's stripping away everything that would get in the way of that and having just two people touch their fork fingers together and that's it. And so that, and that's because it involves people moving, it's called performance art. And because she's dealing with just the concept, instead of making something to help you think of the concept, it's called conceptual art. One of her, another of her famous pieces is that she and her partner decided that they would really take this to the next level. So they started at opposite ends of the Great Wall of China. They documented the entire thing. So anybody anywhere in the world could look in on where they were at that moment. And they walked over a period of, I believe it was two or three months towards each other until they met each other in the middle of that expanse of the Great Wall of China and got married uh, the moment that they met each other. And there's a famous photo where they uh, turn, they um, first see each other on the last day of their journey. You think, well, again, how is that art? Well, we, th we realize that she's doing performance piece and she's doing work that she's stripping away everything to separate you from the idea. So she's not producing a physical thing necessarily. Then we can start saying, well, she's producing conceptual art that deals with relationship. Walking from opposite ends of the Great Wall of China. What does the Great Wall symbolize? A lot of times it represents something absolutely incredible that was designed specifically to uh, repel invaders. So it's a protective wall. And uh, we can associate that with people surrounding them with uh, protective energy or protective habits so they don't have to interact with people. And then she and her partner are walking towards each other over this huge length so that we can uh, maybe think about the great lengths that we may go to for somebody we care about. And then finally, when they meet, they get married, which is a symbol of um, ultimate connection. And so she's like, again, she's dealing with these ideas of human connectedness and human relationships. And when we think of it from that perspective, it can be a, a pretty powerful uh, performance piece. It took them three months to do. So a significant amount of effort. There are several other conceptual pieces that are, are um, force people to rethink how they um, view their relationship with people around them, the world in general, and even how they view what art is. And this started with, um, I say Mar Marcel Duchamp was the originator 
of the modern, contemporary idea of what conceptual art is. If you want to look up his work, he did about a dozen of these conceptual art pieces that really irritated people at his time, but today they be, have become uh, tropes in social media. So people are very aware of them. Another person, uh, the fifth person that we talked about in this module is Wolfgang Leib. He is absolutely amazing. I think he's, he's somebody who was very interested in this idea of conceptual art, but he didn't want to perform necessarily. And um, if he did perform, the performance, if it could be called that, was just the process of building these things. And so he is making something that symbolizes the process, but the whole rationale for the thing itself is to help generate a concept inside of your mind. So for example, when he wanted to address ideas about how the world is, how things grow, uh, maybe get people to think how we interact with our environment, uh, helping or getting in the way of the environment continuing in a natural or an organic way, uh, how we go out of our way to save some things and other things are destroyed, um, how by irrigating uh, arable um, farmland and by placing uh, living structures over large expanses of, of land, there are consequences to uh, the, the biodome. I mean, we, we can't help it. That's, that's just what happens in the process of humans being humans. So he didn't do things that were, were critical of people, but he was doing things specifically to help people start thinking of the magnitude of the world and maybe evaluate our own place in it and help us to be more cognizant of that. And one of the pieces that he did that I think is absolutely astounding is he did the, took this huge room and he collected pollen from millions of plants. And then in this huge room that I think the space he's working on was probably about 20 feet by 20 feet. So, you know, it, it's a good sized room. He took a sifter and very carefully over a period of several days, sifted this pollen into a gigantic yellow square in the center of the room. And then uh, there was a walkway, uh, walk area around it so people could walk around. And we think about pollen all the time. When you come into a room that is absolutely filled with pollen like this, and you start realizing how much energy and care he took into making that exactly that way, then the concepts that would start coming into head are things like, um, what is our relationship to plant life? And then that may lead to ideas about not picking my nose. I'm sorry, trying to keep myself from sneezing. Maybe dealing with ideas of uh, some plants are saving, others die as a consequence of building or just humans living. And maybe we're also thinking about ideas about bees and the necessity that they or the necessary role that they play in our lives and uh, the lives of plants everywhere. Maybe he's thinking about, uh, maybe we're also dealing with concepts about uh, hay fever, for example, and how for some people, hay fever can be devastating enough where um, the presence of pollen feels almost oppressive, if that was sort of makes you feel. But uh, the, I, the thing that's so remarkable about that work is one, it, it's just pollen in a room, but it's a lot of pollen in a huge room and it makes you realize that there is uh, a very um, large set of ideas that potentially we could be thinking about when we're confronted with this huge room of pollen. He did a lot of other stuff too, and it would be kind of fun to, uh, for you to look at other works that he's, he's done. But he's an example of somebody who did, who built physical things that were not really complete in and of themselves or didn't have a lot of meaning in and of themselves until you start thinking about it and start interacting with the concepts that these things are generating. So he was also a conceptual art artist. And then one of my favorite people in, in the whole wide world is a guy named El Anitsui. He's a Ghanaian artist. And he said at one point that he was just walking along out in the middle of nowhere and he sees this discarded bag of trash um, under some bushes. So he walked over and opened it up and he said that 
And where he's from in Africa, in Ghana, uh, milk comes in cans, uh, essentially. And what this bag was full of was lids of milk bottle. I mean, it was it was full of milk bottle or milk can lids. And he thought, well, somebody's just tossing it away. And he started looking at it, and he thought each of the each of these items in the bag, even though they're garbage, they had a really interesting beauty and shape to them that he found fascinating. And he said that that was what started him. Now he builds these gigantic tapestries that are assembled out of things like uh, beer cans or uh, pop bottle lids or uh, things like that that anybody else would just throw away. He has a team of people that work with him to take these smashed up cans or smashed up lids or smashed up containers that is everybody else's garbage. They'll punch holes in them and they'll string them together with metal rings until he will make these tapestries that can cover the walls of many of the buildings on campus. They are just absolutely gigantic. Some of these things are 30 feet high and 50 feet wide. And when you see, and they have folds in them, he, he uh, doesn't just stick them against a wall. He has uh, something of a framework that comes out from the wall. So when he hangs these, they look like um, how cloth will fold and belly out. Uh, you've, you've seen like drapes or uh, things like that. Um, and it makes you think about things like um, maybe walls, maybe blankets, maybe upholstery. Uh, but it definitely has a very textile feel to it, even though it's made out of, for the most part, metal garbage. And what the thing that is so amazing about him is that he approaches everything with an awful lot of design sense. He really knows what he's doing. This is not haphazard at all. He's uh, he built up a studio name for himself so that he will be commissioned to do works and lots of people in his area in Ghana will have jobs working at a studio, building these things alongside him. So those two re reasons I think are really amazing. But the thing that is most impressive is that living in a post-colonial world, he has taken something that somebody else would discard. Somebody would, it's just trash with no value at all. And he's done something to it and put it together into these massive things where he's alchemically transformed it for lack of a better term, into something magnificent and astounding. Something that you look at, if you see, I'm going to be uh, putting a video in for extra credit on this week's attendance. You look at his stuff, and if you can imagine seeing it in person, it's just astounding. You can't believe that human beings would actually put the time and energy into building this. Now, these are definitely objects, but they also make you think quite a bit you know, about the original uh, elements that made up these things and how he's managed to transform somebody else's trash into something that is just astounding. So um, I, the video is going to be about four and a half, five and a half minutes, something like that. And again, you, if you watch it and write a sentence about it, then you will get um, two extra credit points for the attendance. So those are the six artists that we're going to be looking at. There's a lot of styles of artwork that are specific to the world that we live in. For example, nobody before us, uh, before this last century, really had spray cans that were cheap enough, um, especially not cheap enough that people could use them to tag things. And um, there are a couple of two things that you're going to be doing in specific uh, to these ideas of contemporary art. One is I want you to write a reflection, go through the whole module, and then write a reflection about your thoughts on these six different artists, whether or not what they do is, is art, just like uh, other written reflections you've done. And then your studio work for this is going to be making your own example of street art with wheat paste. And there is an explanatory video as well, but this has two elements to it. One is, you are going to be finding something 
that has specific colors and textures that really feels like it belongs outside. And then you're going to be replicating that on a surface like um, side of a cardboard box, for example. And this should be at least the size of a piece of paper, if not bigger. So I would say uh, maybe 18 by 12, 18 inches by 12 inches, something like that. So um, and a cardboard box is great. You can do all sorts of whatever you need to, to build up that texture that feels like it belongs outside. Um, I've had people spray paint it, uh, uh, paint colors that you would like Rust-Oleum that you would use on an outside uh, piece of furniture. I've had people um, paint it with um, a, a base color and then spatter it so it looks kind of like a, a brick-like visual texture. I've had even um, people have even uh, taken spray glue on the cardboard and then um, after spraying it down with the spray glue, sprinkling dirt all over it or placing it upside down in dirt, and, um, then the, that dirt will adhere to the spray glue and it will look like the ground. And so that's, that's one thing, making a, a texture to work against that looks like it feels like it's outside. I've even had people uh, take bark from dead wood. We don't want to strip it off of anything alive and glue that to a piece of cardboard. So it looks like an expanse of um, a tree trunk. And that's great. And then the second part of this is making something that looks like street art. And you'll learn a little bit more about that as you go through the module. And then follow the directions in that we paste video and make these things, then paste them on like a collage onto this background. So you're going to be building something that is after the order of uh, Basquiat. And uh, you can use different things. Uh, you don't have to just do your own things. You can also uh, print up text off the computer, tear pieces of that, and use that as part of your, your collaging uh, for this, and glue that onto um, the background that you've made that looks like it belongs outdoors. So by the time you're done, you'll have a piece about like that, that you'll that looks like it is something from outside. And then on top of it, you will have a collage made of different elements of looking at that video and being aware of what Basquiat did that uh, feels like it, it was it's a uh, street art. I, I do have a couple friends who are um, graffiti artists. Um, and um, they do some some pretty impressive things. One friend of mine is a guy named El Seed, and uh, used, that he was in your artist list. What he does is called calligraphy, where he does uh, calligraphy using graffiti tools. So he will get permission to use an abandoned wall, a wall of an abandoned structure, and then he will do graffiti on or uh, calligraphy on it. He calls that calligraphy. I think one of the most impressive works that he's done was he was um, commissioned to do the artwork on the outside of a mosque in Tunisia. And the calligraphy that he did was Arabic um, phrases from the, from the Quran. So it's pretty amazing stuff that he does. But uh, your inspiration is going to be, I think for this, most, it, I would lean more towards the Basquiat, um, Jean-Michel Basquiat. So pay attention to his stuff and references him when you do your, your studio work. Now, um, for this, we are also doing your PowerPoint, which is your last portion of your research project. Uh, we could make it all due at the very end, but I want people to be able to look at each other's PowerPoints and respond to them. And the PowerPoint, I have given some examples of longer ones that people did, but you guys, are, we're going to have you limited to uh, only five slides, and it should take about three minutes. These five slides, the way that you'll need to do it is one slide, well, the last slide, well, actually, let, let's start at the beginning. Just use your PowerPoint program that you have access to as a student of Utah Tech. You will, um, the first slide will be an image that you think is specific to your artist that represents their work. 
And I want you to have the artist's name on that as well as your name. And you'll put that slide, and then there will be three slides that you can take from the three sources that you've done. They will also have images of the artist's work or the artists themselves. And then the last slide, the fifth slide, will have the text of your three sources uh, from your, your bibliography. It won't have the annotations on it. You won't write anything other than it will just be the three citations. The way that you will do this PowerPoint is you'll set those five slides up and before you do this, I want you to look at the examples that I've linked to in the assignment. Excuse me. You're going to go to PowerPoint. Yeah, I think if you look at the top, about six steps over, it'll show you, um, It'll there'll be a phrase that, oh, let's see if I can pull it up. I can tell you exactly what the phrase is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, nine headings over from the left, there is a word that says record. You're going to hit that and you're going to do hit, uh, make sure that audio is turned on. You're going to turn on your speaker and you're going to uh, hit from beginning and then you're going to cy cycle through each of your five slides, recording in the PowerPoint program, you narrating about the slides. And you're going to narrate for about 45 seconds on each slide. So the first one, you're going to introduce your artist, share some of the insights about them. You don't have to tell us necessarily when they were born or anything, but be very mindful of the four steps of artistic critique as you do this. So you may very well say, my artist is Ella Anatsui. I particularly like him for these reasons. I think his artwork is, is uh, really astounding and I've seen some of his stuff. I just can't believe anybody would spend this much time on anything, but he does. And he seems like a genuinely decent guy. Then you'll go to the second slide and that will have an image from one of your uh, three sources that you looked at perhaps, but an image of the artist or their work. And you'll talk about that, that piece of work uh, using the four steps of artistic critique. You'll describe it briefly You'll uh, analyze it a little bit. I think they did this and this to make this image. You'll interpret it. I think that this is what it means. And then you'll say, I think that this piece was pretty successful, but it's not as good as his later work. And you go to your third slide. It'll have another image of a piece of artwork. Do the same kind of thing. The fourth slide will have a third image of, it, of the artist's work. And you'll do the same kind of thing. Talk about it briefly. And you're recording this whole thing. And then the fifth one, you'll say, and these are these are citations. These are the three sources. This first one was a video. I really liked that because it talked about these things. The second one was a book I found, an article I found online. And the third one, and I, I liked it because of this. And then the third one was another video, which I think made a lot of sense because it showed how the artist made these things. This is my presentation on so-and-so. Thank you very much for listening. And then you end it. You save it. And then you will either take that file and send that file directly and uh, you'll submit it directly on the submission form or if you have access to your own YouTube channel or um, I think it's a uh, Verbo is another one, um, one of those channels, uh, you can record it onto that, upload it onto that and then you can submit the link to me um, in the submission. And that, that's pretty much all it takes. And these should be about three minutes long. So again, five slides, three minutes long. First slide is the introduction to the artist. Second slide is one piece of work that you talk about. Third slide is another piece of work that you talk about. Fourth slide is another piece of work that you talk about. And the fifth slide are the three citations. And then you can share uh, highlights of what you wrote in your annotation there, if you'd like. But you don't have to read your annotations. You don't have to spend more than about 45 seconds on each of the three, the five slides. All right, and you will either send me the file or you will send me a link to your video platform that you've uploaded the file to. And again, you do this by going through the slides in PowerPoint with the record feature turned on using the microphone. Before turning it in, you play it back so that uh, you know how you sound and everything's working okay. If you can't get that to work, what you can do is 
have the five images in a slideshow or other format, and then uh, record a, your own Teams call. Uh, you don't have to have anybody else get on the call. You can just be your own person on the call, but you use the record feature and do the share screen thing uh, or the, the share uh, source feature on Teams and uh, pull up those images and then cycle through those images while you record yourself talking about them. And that's all you have to do. When you're done, do the same kind of thing, either send me that video file or upload it to a video platform that you're using like YouTube or something like that. Vimeo, I'm sorry, not Verbo. Vimeo is the, the other um, video platform I was thinking of. So you can either um, do either of those things and send me the link. So that is the, that will be your, your second to last step of your research project. The last one is you are going to upload that link or the file onto the discussion platform and you're going to find one other person's presentation on the discussion. And you are going to respond, watch their presentation and then respond to it with four sentences. The first one will be describe, second one will be analyze, third will be interpret, and the fourth sentence will be uh, evaluation. So for this, you could say, um, I saw so-and-so's work on, uh, well, um, actually you're going to be putting this as a reply onto what they submitted. So for your description sentence, you could say, this is about three minutes long on this artist with uh, several pictures. I, I, it was nice to see a couple of pictures in each of the slides. The second sentence could be, it looks like you really know how to handle a PowerPoint. And this was at a link to uh, Vimeo. So you were able to upload, um, upload that just fine and everything worked really well. The third one, and interpret. It, I get the impression you really like this artist because the images that you shared and how you talked about it gave a lot of energy to it. I wasn't even familiar with this person before and now I kind of like their stuff too. And then the fourth one is you did an exceptional job. The voice came through just great. And I think your presentation was, was really well done. So four sentences as a reply to somebody else's post. Now, if you notice what I did was things are due this coming Sunday and that's when you will post your own PowerPoint onto the discussion, but then your responses aren't due until the following week. And uh, that's so that everybody has a time to post on the discussion board and then everybody has time to reply to one other person's post. Again, you only have to write four sentences responding to one other person's uh, PowerPoint post on the discussion. Okay, I hope that that makes sense to everybody. I hope that's clear. So again, the two things that we're dealing with this week is your uh, reflection on contemporary art and your street art studio work and your PowerPoint, which is the last step in your uh, research project that you've uh, worked on all semester long. Now, next week, we're going to be uh, finishing up with your um, work on something that should have existed in Sue Diada's time, but didn't. And I will introduce that in the next module and you'll have two weeks to work on that and that you'll be able to turn that in uh, the final week of the class, all right? Again, if you have any questions, if things aren't working quite right, make sure you email me as soon as you can. I have been going through it and grading um, and I will uh, do my best to get caught up again on that by this weekend, if I, if I, there's any way I can, I will definitely do that. And it's what I'm seeing is that many of you are responding to the things that I have mentioned and my observations about grading. You've turned around and resubmitted with those corrections, and that is absolutely wonderful. Even if you um, do that and try, that is always better than just not trying at all. And you will all, and if there's absolutely any way I can, I will do everything I can to make sure you get more points when you resubmit. Actually, that's not true. I will always give you more points when you resubmit as when you make the changes that I've talked about. 
So you will always get more points when you resubmit. I would also recommend um, looking at your quiz grades. And you can retake those quizzes. There's no reason not to get a perfect score. There are only eight or 10 points, but those do build up. So I would recommend heartily uh, this taking this week, going over and looking at your quiz scores and uh, any one that isn't exact, look at it, look at the ones you missed and then reassess it and take it again and resubmit it. And you can like, you, you should be able to take those four or five times if you need to. Another thing that I would really recommend is making sure you're caught up watching all the videos for the, for the class. It's a simple thing to get your attendance points and there's no reason not to do that. Um, and I, again, for attendance for this week, I will also uh, put in a short video on El Anitzui and you can watch that, write one sentence about that after your, your three things you, you learned and uh, submit that for extra credit in the uh, attendance submission as well. All right, again, if you have any questions, any concerns, uh, email me. If you feel that the semester is getting away from you, contact um, the accommodations office on campus and they will do everything they can to help you and then give me the tools that I need to help you as well. All right, hope you guys have an absolutely wonderful week and I look forward to talk, seeing you all next Tuesday. See ya.